Omnissa is the digital work platform leader, trusted by thousands of organizations worldwide as the former VMware end user computing business. It enables IT teams to provide secure, personalized experiences for every employee on any device. The Omnissa platform integrates multiple industry leading solutions across unified endpoint management, virtual desktops and apps, digital employee experience and security, plus compliance based on the trusted Workspace One and Horizon product families. Check them out today at thisweekhealth.com slash Omnissa. Today on Newsday. All this stuff can be done really at the bedside, whether you're in a hospital or home. And I think we can do this. We can help our customers reduce costs, provide better experiences for patients, and hopefully just improve healthcare overall, which is really the experience that we all want. My name is Bill Russell. I'm a former CIO for a 16 hospital system and creator of This Week Health, where we are dedicated to transforming healthcare one connection at a time. Newsday discusses the breaking news in healthcare with industry experts. Now, let's jump right in. All right, it's Newsday, and I'm joined by Ryan Beesing, the head of sales for healthcare on the East Coast for Omnissa. And Ryan, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Bill, for having me. I appreciate it. Probably a lot of people are like, Who's I'm missing it and what does that mean for the well, we, we had Michael Robinson on the show, so people could get that, but you guys are the old VMware end user computing arm. And I think the coolest thing about this is you still have the vertical. Like you didn't get rid of the vertical, you're still very much focused on healthcare. Yeah, 100%. And really, healthcare is the only dedicated vertical at Omnissa now, which you know, was VMware end user computing division. So it's the same team, we've actually grown the team. We've added three or four folks to the team. This year, we've expanded account coverage. Traditionally, had been providers and payers. We've had some med devices, some life sciences, some pharma companies in there. As Michael moved over from VMware to our specific you know, group, we've grown that. And so it's the only targeted you know, vertical at Omnissa, which includes go-to-market strategy, engineering resources, marketing. So we're really excited to really bring some additional healthcare solutions to our customers than just the general platforms that most customers have been used to with the previous VMware brands of Workspace ONE and Horizon moving forward here. And, and the most important thing that healthcare professionals want to hear is that you're not part of the acquisition. You were spun out, you are your own entity. We are popping champagne bottles and excited for everything. So uh, we are outside of Broadcom. I think we just got a notice yesterday that a few other countries have now joined us from Broadcom, so that took a little bit longer for some legal entities to get set up around the globe. But majority of the 4,000 employees are now officially on NISA LLC. We are independent, no ties to Broadcom. Moving forward, there's still a few applications we share that we will be off of by the end of the year. So we are excited to fully be on our systems here. Really by January 1, we'll be completely independent from, from Broadcom. It is really incredible how complex, because I've experienced some of this on the back end. We had people on the call who had Omnissa email addresses, people who didn't. This is like an M&A in healthcare. It's like how, oh. but on, on steroids, because it's multiple countries, it, it was really complex. All right, let's get to the news. First news story we're, we're pulling out is how Mass General Brigham built the largest hospital at home. You sent over this story. I like this one. And essentially what they're doing is they're setting up acute care beds. Mm -hmm. in people's homes with the help of Best Buy. As we know, Best Buy Health has gone into the, actually not gone into, it's their business. They go into homes and they set up technology. It just happens to be healthcare technology at this point. And let's see, I, th I think one of the key things here, health systems are now at the capacity uh, for 70 patients and is currently treating about 50 to 60 a day in their home setting. The goal mm -hmm. is to move to 10% of Mass General's overall capacity or about two to 300 patients being cared for out of the home. What struck you about this article? It's been very interesting. I was looking for something different than AI security. That's been the <laughs> big head headline news. And it's, it's very relevant. I think we'll probably end up delving into some of those kind of conversations. We also just had our inaugural of NISA user conference in Dallas the last couple of days. And some topics came up about this. I think what really excited me is really just the continuation of hospitals to meet patients where the care is. And I've been in this space for 14 years this, and use a computer space from the old AirWatch days through all the acquisitions. And we've been partnering with health systems for a long time to do this. It mainly was like remote patient monitoring. Now these hospitals are investing a lot since COVID, right before COVID, to set up acute care in these systems. And so I think for us, it's really exciting that we can continue to evolve our solutions, our healthcare solutions to customers to support this with partners throughout these ecosystems, whether it is med devices, 
whether it's technology partners, application partners, or solutions are a fantastic platform for help to bring that point of care to our customers where they are. And this evolution of customers, of really hospital systems who are our customers, going to their customers, the patients at their home, is really interesting to us. And that ultimately they could help reduce cost is probably the biggest topic we've seen over the last, maybe outside of security over the last year, saying, hey, how do I help reduce my costs? And I think some things that they're doing to reduce costs and bring care to patients is a great fit for uh, what we're seeing as a macroeconomic view out there in healthcare. Yeah. So I think there's two, two things as I look at this. One is, this is a continuation of a trend that has been going on for years, which is essentially more and more care is being moved out of the campus, out of the aesthetic. That's not to say that they're not overwhelmed and full. It's just to say more and more, you used to talk about remote patient monitoring. We have, we have retail health, we have surgery centers, we have now hospital at home. We have all sorts of nurses coming to the home and whatnot. This is just a continuation of that. And if we extrapolate this out over the next 10 years, it's not to say that we will do less care out of the hospital itself, but we're going to be doing more care remotely. Obviously the baby boom generation is the, the last of them will retire in 2029, I think is what I read recently. And if the baby boom generation, as they have with everything else moves through and gets into that retirement age, the demand for healthcare services is only going to continue and be strong, especially in those acute care settings. But it also puts the challenge on how are we going to make the spaces we have viable? And also keep in mind that we could end up with the same things we ended up with schools, right? Mm -hmm. you, you keep building to serve this population. And then all of a sudden, 20 years from now, as this population begins to die, now all of a sudden we have way too much space for the community that we're serving. We could end up with another problem for the next generation of, of healthcare leaders to deal with, which is like an, an overcapacity problem. But here's what I want to talk to you about. So I'm necessarily specifically more and more of this care is moving to the edge. It's moving outside of our realm. What does this mean from a technology perspective? How do we think about security? How do we think about the data that's being generated in the home? We're putting these devices in the home. They're generating data. That data has to get back to the EHR. The EHR doesn't reside in the home. It resides okay. in some cases in the cloud, in some cases just back at the health system. How are we thinking about the architecture to support this kind of business model? Yeah, no, fantastic question. I think that ends up being the challenge of getting the data back to the, the EHR and then making that data useful and also making that experience seamless for that end user, whether I'm accessing it from a, a phone, whether it's accessed from a tablet, a remote session in, in a virtual app. And so I think that's a really key feature that in this platform enables is a seamless end user experience to access any application on any device, really anywhere. And so the architecture that we set up with the platform is to have that sort of made seamless to the end user behind the scenes. They literally just pull up their phone, pull up their tablet, click on an app and magically make it work. And so in the background, what the platform is doing is detecting all this data to say, hey, where is this user? Are they on network? Are they off network? What is the quality of service that user has to access for that application? What is the security for that application? Is it signed on individually? Is there single sign-on capabilities? And so what we've done is basically extrapolated all that potential end user frustration out and said, hey, go to this app, click on it, authenticate with your fingerprint or your, your face ID, and you can now interact with your customer, your patient through that. And the Omnisa platform can enable that to really end user on any device in a very secure manner. So we try to make that seamless and easy for anybody that's accessing any type of application, whether I mentioned mobile, virtual, you know, physical application, Windows, Mac, et cetera. As I think about the edge, one of the things that's going to happen in October is Apple's going to release its Apple intelligence yes. for the mobile phone and whatnot. Do you think that's going to lead to more AI being developed at the edge, performing tasks and duties at the edge, and then just delivering the stuff back to the cloud that needs to be delivered? Sure. Absolutely. I think it's, you're pushing that data to the fingertips of users. Now you can search on your phone, you click on a website and you just go to Google and it generates an AI result for that. I think naturally people are going to interact with that data more and more because it's extrapolated and put at our fingertips to just really, what is the result for this? How do I go and, and get the best answer for it? So I think the answer is, is yes. I think the, really the challenge would be is how do we deal with that, that data? Is that data truthful? Is that the right information? How do we kind of fact check that data? So I think that's always the challenge in this space is making sure that the information we have is the right information to, to interact with. So as we go and get this data from the edge, we've got to bring it back and be able to validate that data. 
there's a lot of various applications that can create really fantastic interoperability to make sure that, hey, I'm cross-referencing data from two or three sources. If I'm making a recommendation, I'm giving the best recommendation to my patient as an example for this kind of medication or this kind of procedure. So I think it's something we're going to have to deal with. And I don't know if it's been really figured out yet. Join This Week Health for a deep dive into third-party risk management with Intraprise Health. Miroslav Balote, CISO at Valley Health, will share his journey to building an integrated risk management program that automates and simplifies vendor risk. Alongside experts George Pappas and Scott Matilla from Enterprise Health, this session will cover the latest challenges and practical solutions in managing cybersecurity threats. Don't miss this valuable conversation on protecting your organization and improving compliance without overburdening your team. You can register now at thisweekhealth.com slash cybersecurity priorities to secure your spot. How much has generative AI infiltrated your daily work and your team's daily work, do you think? Yeah, a little bit there. I, I think it's not overwhelming at, at this point in time. I think we see it as a way to just enhance the current experience that, that people get. So how do we help customers? And a lot of times our customers are the IT teams. Like how do we help them solve problems for their customers, whether it's patients, doctors, nurses, in a much you know, easier way? manner. And so some things we've done is says, hey, for example, we're on a Zoom meeting and occasionally you're using a technology and application and one user is having an issue with it. So we can go and quickly detect things like that we've been doing for a couple of years, anomalies, provide root cause analysis out there. And now we're bringing these sort of generative AI and just and do some basic search text and say, hey, who else has this version of Zoom out there that's having issues? Populate these re results for our customers and they can go and detect across maybe you know, hundreds or thousands of users where there might be issues in their environment. So we're using Gen AI to really enhance that experience for our customers, which is typically IT, to solve problems before their end users say, hey, let me pick up the phone and you're done. But you're not using it yourself. I'm not using it myself a ton. No, not on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it's something that we're trying to embed more in our platform to better support the needs. For myself, it's a little bit of search results, finding answers, those kind of things, but it's not... I think taking over my daily workflow and daily lifestyle yet. Yeah, it, it's been interesting. So I did get a license for everybody in my team, but it's only 13 people. So it's not going to break the bank. And I asked that question on a staff meeting recently is how are you using this? Are you using this? And I would say over half the team is using it multiple times a day in the course of their job to fine tune uh, an email. It's a lot of words at this point, right? So it's, it's mm -hmm. fine tuning some documents they're putting together or some marketing they're putting together or something that's going out. And the, the other area that people were talking about is they keep going into tools, like on the web, they keep going into tools and the tools now have a button there that says, would you like AI to do this for you? Like you gave us enough information, we could write the rest of this. I, I posted a job this morning and I put in some information. I said, would you like, like us to write the job description? I'm like, I'm curious what you would write. And so yeah. I clicked the button and it wrote some stuff and I'm like, I didn't use it, but I'll tell you, I, I did pull stuff from it and I'm like, sure. oh yeah, that's good. I should have included that and whatnot. It was pretty interesting. It's starting to show up in our everyday tools. It's just like our iPhone. It's going to show up on our iPhone. And now all of a sudden my 87 year old father is going to have access to AI and he's going to be like, Hey, how do I use this? Exactly. And that's a good point. I actually did have a Rex. We added somebody to my team in the last you know, week or two here. And so I didn't use it personally, but working with our recruiting team, they did use it. They go and gathered previous job postings and, and things like that. They actually ran it through some, some tools and we ended up leveraging more of the previous stuff we had used, but a lot of the functionings around that was used by HR and recruiting. Marketing does use it a little bit. We took as we moved to Omnissa, we had to you know, update the brand, update sort of our, our healthcare solutions for our customers as we're going and, and talking about just you know, who we are, what we do, who do we support. So there's been a little bit of it used from a day-to-day -day basis, not as much from specifically me and, and my team, but from cross functions in the company. Then yes, it's starting to be, be used a little bit more. We'll close on this. The last, I just haven't done a news day, I think since the Apple announcements. And so Apple did a couple of things around healthcare. One is FDA approved sleep apnea, monitoring and then the second is around their the airpods as a hearing aid device is uh, pretty fascinating as well i know that tim cook many years ago i think three four years ago said he believed that the biggest impact apple was going to have on the world was going to be around healthcare mm -hmm. and he continues he doesn't overwhelm us with hey look what we're rolling out it's hey we figured out how to get the watch to do this and we figured out how to get 
the AirPods to do this. And they just keep adding it in. And because these devices are with us every day, this phone doesn't leave my side for maybe eight hours a day. The rest of the time it's with me. He sees an, a great opportunity to utilize the information that it could passively collect mm -hmm. and to augment some of the challenges we have in, in hearing and sleeping and, and those kinds of things. I know you sent over this article as well. What's your take on what Apple's doing these days? I think it's fantastic. I think it's the whole consumerization of healthcare. I love the ability. I was a former college athlete. My brother was a, was a pro football player, very big into health, wellness, and, and fitness. And I think having this data is, is huge. And so I think the more that the technology enables us to have this data, the better that we can continue to take care of ourselves, improve our life and really ultimately help take control of our healthcare. And so now that we have this data, it's more available. As we go in needing care, my parents get to the age of being baby boomer children, retired and, and needing more care. Like we have all this fantastic data that we can take. And so I think these two articles that we have really tied together to say, hey, now that I have this data that's you know on my watch, on my phone, on an aura ring, a, a whoop strap, whatever it may be, how do I help improve the overall care for that person in the setting that they want to be at? And partly just a, a quick example of some things that resonate of why this is also personal is that I've got two daughters under two. So we're crazy busy, but fun, exciting time here. Our first daughter, we had a birth in a hospital. Everything went fine. Good experience overall. But secondly, we had uh, an at-home birth for, for our second daughter. And it was just a complete game changer for the experience. Quality of service was much more intimate, less noises and bells going off. And I think the more that we can push some of this care to where the user wants to be, they had the butterfly device from GE doing all sorts of the ultrasounds and monitoring. All this stuff can be done really at the bedside, whether you're in a hospital or home. And I think we can do this. We can help our customers reduce costs, provide better experiences for, for patients, and hopefully just improve healthcare overall, which is really the experience that we all want. Uh, Ryan, I didn't know that was a thing. My wife tells a story of her mother was born in the home that she lived in her entire life. Mm -hmm. And when I talked to her mom about it, she just that's just the way things were done back then. And then they all went to hospitals. Are we starting to come back to the home? I, I think we're seeing a little bit of that and threw a curveball at you there. But yeah, I think the quality of care that we felt we got, let alone the, the bill, was significantly different <laughs> between the, the hospital bill and the at-home bill. I think it was much more reasonable for that. I think you're seeing a shift from that. I think part of it was COVID happened and like you didn't go in if you didn't need it. And so that if you can provide care in a much more intimate setting with really the same tools that we had in a hospital for monitoring my, my wife and the baby and all this kind of stuff are, are really the same with this fantastic technology. I think we're starting to see a little bit of a shift and people feel more comfortable with that versus, hey, you're pregnant, you schedule it, you go to this, which is fantastic. I'm glad there's a, a fantastic medical care out there, but I think you're seeing a little bit of shift of people open to more natural delivery, natural medicine versus just going straight to other avenues in the future. Uh, this, this episode could be titled the uh, ever evolving venues of care. It's a really fun time. Ryan, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for coming on the show. It's been great talking. I appreciate it. Thanks again. Thanks for listening to Newsday. There's a lot happening in our industry. And while Newsday covers interesting stuff, another way to stay informed is by subscribing to our daily insights email, which delivers expertly curated health IT news straight to your inbox. Sign up at thisweekhealth.com slash news. Thanks for listening. That's all for now.